name is Don Beveridge. I'm the coordinator of occupational health and safety at Windsor Regional Hospital, and I am the chair of the Working Towards Wellness Committee. Jeff McEwen, Manager of Recreation Services at St. Clair College, will be moderating the webinar today and uh, handling our, the, any questions that may come up. Before we begin, so just to reiterate, if you're having any audio issues, make sure you, you uh, turn your, the volume of your speakers up. Uh, as far as questions, uh, you can enter them into the, the, the chat. And uh, at the end of the presentation, our, our presenter will uh, address those. If for some reason we don't get to all of the questions, um, we will uh, we will still provide those answers. We'll send the link out. Um, and as well, yeah, the event is being recorded. So uh, we will send a link to the recording as well, uh, along with a short survey um, that uh, we value very much your opinion uh, so that it, it helps us moving forward as we uh, develop further webinars uh, to improve them and serve your needs better. Okay, so without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest speaker for today, Sonia McMahon Colbarton, bereavement educator for the Canadian Mental Health Association, Windsor Essex County Branch. Sonia has worked in mental health and wellness roles within the public sector for over 20 years, assisting a multitude of people of all ages. She obtained her psychology degree from Wilfrid Laurier University, specialized grief and loss certification from the University of Western Ontario, and professional life coaching accreditation from the Coaches Training Institute. Sonia is the bereavement educator for the Canadian Mental Health Association, Windsor Essex County branch, offering various bereavement seminars and webinars as well as coordinating and facilitating a number of loss-specific grief support groups. We thank you, Sonia, for speaking with us today on dealing with grief and bereavement during the COVID-19 pandemic. So again, thank you for being here, joining in on this, what we consider to be very important topic, something we're certainly living this reality right now. Yes, we always experience different types of loss, but the COVID pandemic has changed that in some ways and caused that to give us further things to think about, to be aware of, and to you know, try to address, to be creative in different ways. So I'll talk about that today, and I hope that it's beneficial to you personally, uh, with yourself and your family members as you experience loss, potentially those that you support. Um, in your role, whatever they, that might be in your profession, um, just whatever way that you might use this information. So first of all, uh, we have the land acknowledgement and uh, want to ensure that um, we cover that first of all. John, are you uh, comfortable to, to do that for us? Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, so while, the, while it is a well-traveled land, uh, I respect, respectfully acknowledge and express my sincerest gratitude to be able to gather, work, learn, and reside today in the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, comprised of the Ojibwa, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi peoples. I identify as a settler and acknowledge the importance of the treaties and am committed to the calls to action in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Indigenous peoples continue to experience trauma caused by colonial violence. At CMHA, we are committed to advocating for and reconciling with Indigenous communities across Canada. All right, so to get us started, first of all, I want to focus on and have us reflect on the impact of COVID on mental health in general. We know that this pandemic has influenced us and impacted a large number of people's mental health in a multitude of ways. When we think about the increased anxiety and the stress that's been experienced, perhaps for some excessively wondering about and checking for symptoms, maybe feeling very irritable, just not ourselves. Feelings of insecurity, not knowing what each day will bring, how the numbers will change, if we'll become ill or how our family members will be impacted. The normal aches that we experience might make us wonder and feel like we might have COVID-19. Also sleeping troubles have become more prevalent 
and feelings of both helplessness and hopelessness. So acknowledging these pieces in a general sense, let alone, as I mentioned, when we further this, when we experience loss. So what we have experienced, there's been increased isolation, undoubtedly. The social distancing that's forced us to be apart from our family and friends for weeks and possibly even months. The lack of social support and interactive activities. Yes, we know so well that personal events many times have been either canceled, postponed, or they've been very small. So we've also been unable to gather for some of life's most meaningful celebrations and rituals. And that's included funeral visitations, funerals and memorial services. So that's been really a difficult adjustment, something that we're not used to at all. There's also been the lack of ability to visit ill and dying loved ones. Many families have experienced this difficult reality and may have only seen their loved one for a very limited time, if at all, before they died. A large number of families learned that there's definitely no substitute for physical closeness in someone's life. And we were encouraged to do whatever we could to convey our love and our support. And if some of you are impacted by this personally and emotion is stirred, remember that's okay because I excuse me, suspect that many of you listening in have been impacted firsthand. And all of us are so vulnerable to the emotion that can be experienced. And just to be with that is most helpful. We learned that connecting using technology, while it was not the same, it was helpful. Perhaps some wrote a letter to their dying loved one and asked a care attendant to read it out loud to them. Others maybe made a video and asked that it be played as if you were talking directly to your loved one. Or maybe there was special music or some type of memorabilia that was placed in the room of the ill person. There was also very small in-person limited online funerals, depending on the timing and what the restrictions were at that actual time of death. So in the height of COVID, when funerals were unable to take place, it was recommended that they be postponed rather than canceled. So there it would still take place following the death, even if not immediate. Because we do know that while postponed gatherings may not seem ideal, they are much better than not gathering at all. Virtual events certainly were very common, but whatever we could do to acknowledge the death and integrate the loss was and is important. While oftentimes we think about our ceremonial rituals that we do when someone dies being for that person, yes, it's an honor of that person, but it's actually about us as survivors integrating the death into our life. So this ceremony that we follow and opt for is for us, those left behind, those who are living. And certainly we've had limitations for after-death support since socializing and in-person interaction was so limited. That support that we could provide often was online or by phone. While technology has helped us and certainly been an asset, I believe, we've certainly learned that digital, digital contact does have limitations in the expression of our love and care. So as I step further into this in regard to loss, I'd like to take the opportunity to share with you a firsthand account of a client who has given permission for me to share this. And this is in her words, what she experienced as a result of her husband dying early on in the COVID pandemic. So she wrote, certain events will be forever in my mind. My husband returned to the rehab center in mid-January as he had suffered a stroke in November, 2019 and was in and out of the hospital since that time. I went to visit him every day and remember on March 15th, 2020, the manager went from bed to bed 
announcing that visitors would no longer be allowed inside. Saying goodbye that afternoon would be goodbye forever. But in the visitors' minds, we thought it would only be for a short time. Since my husband could barely talk due to his stroke, trying to communicate on the phone or iPad was not much use. A few days later, I was told that he would be moved to the backside of Prince Road. In November, we'd been told that he had vascular stroke and vascular dementia. How much he understood what was going on, I don't know. But the fact that I no longer came to the hospital must have been difficult to grasp for him and was a nightmare for me. The beginning of April, beds had to be freed up for COVID. I met with a social worker outside on a cold, wet day. He explained the options were to take him home or transfer him to a nursing home. This decision about my husband had to be made then and there. There was no time to think, inquire, or consult. On April 7th, he was transferred. I only saw him going from a car to the lobby of the nursing home. I was totally covered with protective gear and he had a mask on. I'm not sure if he recognized me. And the whole encounter lasted just one minute. I spoke daily to a caregiver, but was told the same words until the day, April 15th, that I got the call to go to the nursing home. That was also the day that he died. I'm very grateful that I was let in that morning to be with him for the last hours of his life, but COVID has left scars that will be forever there, physically and mentally. COVID made it impossible to talk to nurses and doctors and to ponder different medical options. COVID made it impossible to be with my husband in the room and have a proper burial. COVID also made it impossible to have our daughter who lives in Michigan at the funeral and for her to have the benefit of that ritual to assist she and her family to see the reality and integrate the loss into their lives. COVID made it impossible for her to comfort me in person and has made my recovery lonely and difficult. I do feel that COVID has scarred me for life. So it certainly goes without saying, this lady is expressing that these realities have caused a great deal of stress and need for adaptation that she can. Certainly very, very difficult. So in regular times, what is normal? The word bereavement, we may not always think about, means to be torn apart and to have special needs. So when we magnify this through the pandemic, that's what is really, really something we need to focus on and be even more mindful about being patient with ourselves and others to work through any loss that we're experiencing. So grief, just to differentiate between that and mourning, we tend to use these words as synonyms to mean the same thing, but they're actually different. Grief is the internal meaning associated with death. So that consists of feelings, thoughts, and images that we experience. We know that as humans, whenever our attachments are threatened, harmed, or severed, we do naturally grieve. So essentially, it's everything we think about and feel inside of us. And it's not uncommon to experience shock and disbelief, even with expected death. This is actually a helpful piece. It's a natural defense mechanism as we are bombarded with all these emotions. And it helps us especially get through the initial days. There's also the feelings of worry and fear, sadness and loneliness. We may become angry, feel guilt and or regret. Whatever the case with death loss, we experience a multitude of emotions. 
and the thoughts and feelings themselves related to the pandemic caused grief and experiencing death has certainly compounded that. But it's known that we not only need to grieve, we also need to mourn. Mourning is that outward expression of grief. You may have heard it referred to like some authors and grief educators such as Dr. Alan Wolfelt do, as grief gone public. It's expressing our feelings outside of ourselves. That's the piece that we more so struggle with because we naturally feel inside what is going on, but we tend to place those shoulds on ourselves, thinking I shouldn't feel this way, I should be okay, or I knew my loved one was going to die. Whatever the circumstance, though, we do need to mourn. We don't just get over grief. We need to work through it. If you hear people saying, or perhaps have said this yourself, time heals. I'd like you to think of it this way. It's not just time on its own that heals. It's what we do in that time. So we need to engage in that expression. Perhaps not only talking and crying, but writing, being creative. There aren't right or wrong ways to express ourselves, but it certainly is our ways. We own these ways and we recognize the necessity of them. If you think of it this way, I really appreciate this analogy. To me, it's a, a quite a good visual that I first learned um, doing a session for children's grief, but I think all of us, no matter what age, can benefit from this. So if you think of grief as a balloon inside of you, an inflated balloon in your stomach, and this balloon is very large, containing the multitude of feelings that I've been talking about. So they don't just go away. They're very heavy inside of us, potentially. That's the reason, as I mentioned, we need to work through them. But if we can vent some air out of that balloon, if we can communicate our sadness, our feelings of despair, whatever is there with a few safe people, personally and or professionally, that helps allow some of that air out of the balloon. The balloon is still there, it doesn't just disappear, but some of that heaviness and discomfort goes away. So that's how I'd like you to think about doing this work of mourning. And we recognize the importance of mourning all the time, but during the height of the pandemic, it was more difficult because we couldn't just naturally interact with one another. Maybe there was contact with close family members, but even some of that was on the phone or online, as well as working with therapists and support groups. It was encouraged and continues to be to allow those feelings out in whatever way we're able. And at CMHA, we have been back to in-person support, but also with the option of joining online. And some people, even for groups, have continued, while some are in the room, distance, others are on screen joining because of their, last, their lack of comfort. So it's been about joining people where they're at as much as possible, but giving that safe space for outward expression. It's evident that those who've been able to stay connected as much as possible and be honest and open about their feelings have been most effectively able to work through their grief. It also has been interesting and challenging, of course, to work with people and know the challenges that are felt because certain things that would normally be done, certain things that those of us who support them would normally suggest have not always been available throughout the pandemic. For instance, when there's commonly suggestions made like engaging in um, support and social activities at places like Life After 50, it was tough to find alternatives. 
But we certainly did that, recognizing that the options we had needed to be used to their fullest. So not, you know, ruling out that friends could be effective support, or even if there was resistance to maybe joining a group online or working with a therapist on the phone, that was encouraged to be open and try that. And fortunately, many people did recognize the benefits. So all this to say that, yes, grief is very normal and necessary. It certainly needs and deserves this expression. We need to feel the pain of grief in order to heal it. Dr. Alan Wolfelt, who some of you may be familiar with because of his regular visits to Windsor sponsored by Families First Funeral Home, that's um, one of his lines that many are familiar with. And remember, in order to help themselves and give permission that yes, this journey, no matter what, needs to be felt in order to be worked through. It's never about just getting over it as much as we would like to. The other piece I'd like to mention, there's a tendency to label our emotions as positive or negative. But if we can think about it, encourage others to realize our emotions really just are what they are, not positive or negative. Certainly, it's much more favorable to feel the happiness rather than the sadness, frustration, and anger. But giving ourselves permission to feel whatever comes is what it really needs to be about. And not thinking we need to be the rock of our family because we always have. I'd like to express it this way, and whether you take and remember these words or put it in your own, but if we can embrace our feelings and allow them, that's what it's all about. Yes, it does seem foreign to think, embrace my feelings of anger, of frustration, of resentment, but if we can be with them rather than try to fight them, that's where we make helpful progress in this grief journey. We do know also that grief is very unpredictable and there's no quick fix for it. But what we do in that time is so helpful and necessary. We also tend to want to put a time frame on grief under normal circumstances, let alone during a pandemic. And that's something that's very individual. We cannot put a time frame on grief. But again, if we can just be with it and allow ourselves to take some steps forward and acknowledge those difficult steps back that we also know are part of the journey. Morning rituals are very key in progress that we make in allowing us to work through our grief. Death rituals not only help truly acknowledge a death and express necessary feelings, but they bring family and friends together to support one another. And funerals are especially important when it's not possible to be with the dying person or view the body. As I mentioned earlier, if pandemic restrictions prevented a funeral shortly after the death, hopefully there was or will be planning taking place to have one in the upcoming months. There's no denying that the need to restrict the number of people allowed to gather was very different and not desirable for many. Although live streaming helped, the lack of physical presence we need to acknowledge and that not being able to be together was very challenging. And even when a few close family members were allowed to attend in person, maintaining six feet of distance, that was also difficult for us to be with. So how do we continue on and allow ourselves to heal when there's been the experience of what is already something that we tend to struggle with when that's been heightened because of the pandemic reality? So coping strategies that are normally helpful are to maintain a routine and do such things as engage in meditation and or prayer. Reading as well. 
we do know that after loss, we tend to not have the same level of concentration. But even reading, even reading small amounts, maybe one page inspirational verses, little things go a long way. Maybe spoken affirmations or attending online services for support and education. Yoga can be practiced at home or in a public setting. Journaling, that's another really large one. And I find so many people say, I really just don't know what to write. I wouldn't know where to start. But I go back to putting pen to paper or fingers to our keyboard and just allowing the thoughts and feelings to come. And we're normally surprised at what surfaces. Practicing mindfulness is also really, really helpful. That means learning to be present in our immediate surroundings. And when we're mindful of the present moment, that can usually help us to feel more grateful. So that gratitude assists in our hopefulness. And it's never about minimizing the loss, but it's about recognizing what we still do have and what we can hold on to in our times of sadness and despair. Doing things also like going out in nature, walking, being mindful of, you know, getting out and, and just being in the moment is really excellent for us. And if yourself or others that you support don't feel you have that motivation to go out, even for small lengths of time, you know, a 10, 15 minute walk being outside, that does more than we could ever imagine. And if someone is struggling with that motivation and sticking to these types of things, it can be very helpful to have a buddy, to have an accountability wellness partner, to connect to and make sure that you're actually doing these types of things. Perhaps connecting by phone when going for that walk, or maybe there is the possibility to meet in person and go together. We always need to practice self-compassion. We tend to be the hardest on ourselves when we're experiencing any life challenge and certainly loss, right? We think, I, I'm taking so long to get over this. My family and friends all seem to be fine and not necessarily, but even if they are, Practicing that self-compassion and allowing yourself to just be where you need to. Sign the, the self-criticism doesn't benefit any of us. So connecting with others and engaging in what we refer to as both loss-related activities as well as restorative exercises. And what I mean by that, examples of loss-related activities include looking at photos of our loved one talking about the person, keeping their memory alive, allowing ourselves to laugh, reflecting on time shared, um, as well as have tears. Maybe that will be at the same time. But really being present, maybe it's watching um, precious home movies, you know, that we see them and also hear their voice. Those are considered loss-related activities where the restorative ones are more about making, making plans for the future, engaging in social activities, vacations, et cetera. So doing some of each and certainly feeling that it's positive to laugh and have a good time, knowing that, yes, our loved ones aren't able to anymore, but they would most certainly want that for us. Perhaps another coping strategy for you or those you support would also be less exposure to the news. That in regular time can be helpful, but especially with the impact of the pandemic, there are benefits to limiting exposure. So there's not so much of that harsh reality that comes in as you're trying to cope, if that's something that's uh, influencing you in a non helpful way. And also reflecting on how your lost loved one would desire you to respond. So basically in line with what I've mentioned, as far as 
having those meaningful times together. Yes, they're not here physically present, but perhaps your belief system allows you also to know that, that they're not that far away. And as much as I can name, um, sorry, as much as I can think of so many clients that have said to me, you're going to find it odd, but I hug my loved one's picture. I kiss my loved one's picture. I talk to them. We don't find that odd. Doing what is meaningful and connects you to your loved one is certainly not about right or wrong. It's about being present as you choose. We certainly always want to minimize the isolation and loneliness. We know that as human beings, we're naturally social creatures. And this has been emphasized when we haven't been able to during the pandemic. So we've needed to be very intentional to reach out to one another. Try to be creative in the possibilities that we have, right? Whether it is connecting online to talk, to share in a tea or glass of wine, to share in a craft or paint night, whatever that is, but to be connected and talk and allow feelings to surface as well. So being intentional and consistent and having it where we're really listening to one another. Two-way communication is so vital. And this makes me think back to an early mentor that I had. And I want to emphasize this with you because so often with grief, I think there's the reality that it's found that, you know, I don't know what to say, or I'm just not sure how to support someone. That listening, that presence, that holding the space for someone is the largest we can do. And the mentor I had when I was very young in this field who said, it's about being there, being sensitive, and being silent. Of course, we don't mean total silence, but there's a tendency to fill the space with words that maybe aren't necessary. So remembering that, whether you're connecting in person or by other means, and establishing that safety net allowing yourself to be open and honest with each other. I think about what we experienced during the pandemic, even starting support groups online and the relationships that were established because people were open to that. And then some of them deciding they needed more. So they met up outdoors to go for a walk. So trying not to put a lid on this and focus on what's not possible but being and moving forward with the possibilities. So practically speaking as well, we also need to remember how important it is to even focus on our breath, to focus on our senses and acknowledge our thoughts without judging them, being with them. When we have problems looking at what creative solutions might be. And with this, it's about, again, giving ourselves the time and space, setting healthy boundaries, but not boundaries that stop us from doing things that are helpful. It's also beneficial to keep our brains challenged. I mentioned maybe limiting our exposure to media, but certainly staying connected with those we're comfortable with. And we do know that there are some people that we tend to feel more supported by, more comfortable with to share. Recognize that that's okay. There are some people that you will share intimately with and encourage those you support to do so, and others that it will be more about general conversation. And you be the judge of what that best looks like but not being afraid to check in with others. And when it's about support, I think we tend as just the, the nature of, of who we are in our society, tend to want to be more givers of our help rather than accept support. But if we can also look at that from the perspective of when we allow someone to support us, 
we may be really helping them in their grief journey. Perhaps they also knew the person that we were connected with and are grieving. And for them to make that difference, even though they didn't know the person as well, and support us, that assists in their own personal journey. Or even if they perhaps didn't know the person, right? There's a tendency to forget how much it means to someone when we can be with their support, accept food, allow them to, you know, give us a call and check in. Okay, so I just want to look at that from both perspectives, because we tend to be more okay with being the helper rather than accepting help. But there'll be a time and probably has been a time for each of us already to be in both those roles. But again, allowing others to support you as well. And I'd like to focus for a few minutes on some practical coping strategies. I mentioned a minute ago how important it is to breathe. Don't we probably many days get so busy in what we're focused on and needing to accomplish that we just don't take time for as we might even refer to that vital breath. We breathe shorter. We're not breathing fully in and out. So I've included here for you some coping set techniques, some breathing exercises. The first one on the left that talks about acknowledging things with each of the five sen senses. You may acknowledge, say, five of each. This particular example has you acknowledge five that you can see, four that you can touch, three that you can hear, etc. And the purpose of this is really just to ground us, to help us be in the moment, to breathe and feel more relaxed. On the right side, there's a progressive muscle relaxation that you'll see as well and goes through the whole body. You might try this yourself and or encourage others to use this. For the moment, we're going to look at the square breathing exercise. This may be something that you've done before. If so, that's great. If not, if you can just be with me for a couple times, we'll go through this. It'll help you realize that even small things make a large difference. So if you're comfortable to just close your eyes and we'll engage in what we call the square breathing or box breathing exercise. If you find it difficult to inhale and hold your breath, it may be helpful to put a slight amount of pressure on your chest. So first of all, inhale, two, three, four, and just holding that, two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four, and then when we rest, we allow ourselves to be aware of the space that we're in. We're going to try that again. If you find that it's difficult for you to really stop and be present, you may find that it's helpful to trace a square as I'm going through on your hand. So this would be inhale, hold, exhale, rest or maybe on your leg, okay? So we'll just try that again, closing your eyes, inhale, hold, exhale, rest. Inhale, hold, exhale, One more time, inhale, hold, exhale, and rest. So just taking a moment to do this for a few times, I hope that you've seen 
the place that you can come to in a very brief time to pause and reflect. And this on a normal day, but certainly also to use as a tool as we're feeling the heightened emotions as we're bereaved, which remember means to be torn apart and to have special needs. So just to conclude, I want to remind each of us that it's so important as we're grieving to feel what we feel. And I love the language used here, honoring the light and the dark. Honoring the light and the dark. In other words, the happy and the sad and everything in between because it all does belong. It's all authentic. And whatever is authentic is normal and necessary. It's not about burying our feelings, but we do need to accept the hurt of painful memories. Also making rest and self-care a priority, making time to recognize how valuable this is. Certainly also having signs of life around us, plants, pets, and people, having those as signs of hope when we're grieving. Also avoiding major decisions for the first six months to a year, if that is possible. Not rushing decisions, not rushing parting with their belongings, but being very patient as we go through all of this. Also, it's vital to make plans to acknowledge significant days. I don't mean it needs to be anything elaborate or expensive, but acknowledging days that are significant, like Anniversary dates, commonly bereaved, refer to those as angel anniversary dates. Maybe birthdays or holidays. By putting a picture in a more prominent place, by cooking your loved one's favorite meal, by making a donation in their honor, etc. Doing what's special and significant to you. No matter what, we need to trust ourselves as we grieve. We need to, and I'm aware of the time, so I'm just going to go through this very quickly, acknowledge where we're at without judgment so we can be with this experience, reorganize as we need to in our life, stepping back, seeing what needs to be changed, and ultimately reinvesting in other relationships and perhaps new interests. Ideally, if we can integrate loss into our life, so it doesn't become complicated grief, so it doesn't become intense and dominate our life where the future seems bleak and empty. That's what we want to do. So this work at the outset is vital for that reason. And for each of us to accept, again, this is where we need to be. So we've observed with COVID, there's been loss of routine, perhaps more lack of motivation, tendency to feel overwhelmed and, and further distress. Maybe we've reduced our self-care and we have more of a negative lens in how we view the world. And there's been a tendency to isolate either voluntarily or maybe not so much or withdraw. But as we've observed these things, if we can still be positive, hopeful, and allow ourselves to learn from the pandemic, that it may mean being creative, but still being grateful and also being mindful of the present moment is greatly what it's about. Because we know that grief is as natural as crying when we're hurt, sleeping when tired, eating when hungry, or sneezing when our nose itches. It is nature's way of healing a broken heart. And the essence of finding meaning in the future is not to forget our past, even if we may have been told that, but instead it's to embrace it. For it's in listening to the music of our past that we can sing in the present and dance into the future. Because we do need to allow things to flow. Every darkness is certainly followed by a sunrise. So thank you for your time and listening. I hope you've gotten at least what I might refer to as a golden nugget or two in what I've shared today. The bereavement program through CMHA can be accessed by 
the phone number on the screen, also the crisis line, um, but it's about requesting to do a bereavement intake and someone works with the person who calls to do the assessment and guide them to those services. There's seminars and webinars continuously available, as well as one-on-one -on -one therapy for those who um, fit that bill, as well as law-specific groups. We're also very mindful and try to keep on top of what local funeral homes offer and refer people there, as well as to other um, agencies and options like the newer Julian's House that now is in our community. And I have also included here on our CMHA website, we have an extensive list of bereavement resources as well. So you may want to access that. And just pointing out too, um, there's an option through the Dr. Bob Kent Hospice that is newer that um, people can reach out to for text messaging or online support. And that is something that we know has become larger, more desirable for some. So being aware of that too. And also certainly our grief works program that we have through CMHA that offers one-on-one -on -one and group support for children and teens, as well as caregiver education. There's the number there too for crisis services, a list of resources for children that is taken from online, but I really like this because it gives a brief description of the resource as well as age appropriateness. And lastly, a few resources for caregivers. And another grief network that we're aware of and uh, encourage those who might benefit from making use of the children in grief, the children and youth grief network. And lastly, I will. Um, Turn it back over to John. Some local resources are listed on the screen um, for your, your use in a more broad sense. So again, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Sonia. Um, yes, yeah, so there are uh, some local resources, um, Family Services, Windsor, Essex, um, as well the uh, uh, FSEAP, the, the Employee Assistance uh, Program. Uh, we choose website. Uh, has uh, resources as well for, to support mental health and well-being. Uh, the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers, uh, uh, known to us as OCOW, uh, also has resources. And of course, the CMHA website. So uh, lots of great information and, and ideas uh, in today's presentation. Thank you very much again. Um, okay, um, just, just review some of the... The comments, uh, again, um, uh, several individuals, uh, participants, uh, noting that there was plenty of helpful information. I totally agree with that. Um, very, very positive feedback. So um, I think uh, if, if there are any questions, um, you can just please direct them to, uh, to one of us, or you can reach out to one of the resources, but we will certainly um, get back to you and uh, uh, to each and every one of you with... Uh, uh, links to the presentation and uh, a very short survey. So with that, thank you everyone for joining us today and stay tuned for our next webinar. Thanks so much for having me. I guess you all made it easy on me with not having questions. <laughs> some, uh, some of what was shared was valuable to each one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia.